allegations of misconduct in Parliament, obviously uh, made all over the place this weekend, but is that problem unique to Westminster? Well, Nicola Sturgeon says she won't shy away from those issues. But one of her MPs remains in the party despite complaints against him. Well, Scotland's First Minister joins us now. Lovely to see you this morning. Very, very good indeed. Uh, you've Thank been you. First Minister for nearly seven and a half years. Later this month, you will become the longest-serving First Minister. Huge achievement. I'm sure you've had to fight many battles along the way. But just looking, as we're talking about with Westminster, sexism, allegations and misogyny, what was it like for you, maybe not now, but when you first started? Have you experienced that culturally around you? Yes, I, I don't think there's a woman alive, not just in politics, but in any walk of life who will not have experienced somewhere on the spectrum of misogyny and sexism behaviour that is unacceptable. I mean, for many, and I would include myself in this, that will be at the end of the spectrum that is inappropriate comments and a, a sense of a, a culture of, of sexism, uh, people making comments, men usually making comments about how you look and what you wear and your hair and things like that. Of course, for some women that goes to the other end of the spectrum and involves serious sexual assault and for some women, uh, murder and they lose their lives to that. So it's a societal problem. But there's no doubt for a, a range of different factors, I suppose, that it can be worse in politics and in public life. And you talked about when I was first in politics and what it was like then. In some ways, I think it is worse today than Do it was really? when I was in, in a much way? younger woman starting out in, in politics. What, yeah. In what way? Cause because I remember I think, a male from I, I think page, there is a, while you're just answering that, that people can look at, where you and Theresa May, both seriously powerful women at the time, were pictured together and the debate, well, there you see the headline, never mind Brexit, who won Lexit? It was a comparison of your legs. Is that yeah. the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not really. I mean, that kind of thing is unacceptable. Um, and women have been getting reduced to their body parts for as long as I can remember and probably long, long before that as well. I, th I think what I was talking about, though, was the culture, the very toxic culture that, frankly, social media plays a big part right. in creating and sustaining. So, you know, the people who will hurl sexist abuse at women in public life or anywhere else, they've always been there, but social media gives them direct access in a way that didn't exist when I was much younger. And I think it has also it led to a situation where things that previously some people would have thought but never said, there is a sense that they can say them now on social media because they don't have to come I, face I, to I face with people. And I, I know, I couldn't speaking agree more. to younger women in politics... I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's a, social media is a passport to saying and doing all kinds of things which simply wouldn't have happened before it existed. Can I just take you back to what you said there, Nicola, if I can call you that? Um, you, that, that you were basically sexually harassed, but not, not physically, but, but verbally. You were at that end of the spectrum, you say, as a young, emerging politician. Can I ask you how you dealt with it? Um, I think when I was younger, it, to be frank, when you're really young, particularly when you're in a, a male-dominated environment, as politics is, and frankly, as many walks of life were back then, and to some extent, although to a lesser extent, still are today, I, I don't think at the time you really realise and understand the nature of what you're dealing with. There is yeah. a sense in which you just take it for granted, that it is the way things are and, and the way... Uh, that things uh, have always been and therefore you have to accept a certain level of that and, and almost internalise it. And it's only really now, I think, looking back on that, that I would identify some of what mm. I and, and many other women experienced as sexism yeah. uh, and yeah. misogyny. So, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's positive and that we're now recognising it for what it is. I, I suppose for me, the last point um, I would make on this, you know, I've been in politics, I've I hesitate to say this because it just makes me feel terribly old, but I've been in politics for, what, 30 years. And I, I guess, you know, for somebody like me, and this is not a good thing, um, you become a bit inured to mm. it and get used to it. Whereas I, I see it much more starkly through the eyes of younger women that will talk Why? to me. And I know, and this, we're in a council election right now, in this election, 
my party, and I think it will be the same for other parties, have found it more difficult than at any election that I can remember to encourage and persuade women to come forward. Can I just throw the latest... Because a sense that politics yep. is not a safe space. Sorry to interrupt, but as you know, we're really pushed for time and you have to be away in three minutes to do another interview. Yeah, so let's sure. get this one in. Um, I'm sorry to throw a poll at you, um, but you're used to it. Uh, the latest YouGov poll has 39% of people living in Scotland saying yes to independence, but 44% saying no. Um, after seven and a half years, that must be disappointing for you. Um, no, look, I, I think when we come to make the choice in independence again, I, I'm convinced people will vote yes. But, you know, if I cast my mind back to a few years before the 2014 referendum, you wouldn't even have had that level of support uh, for yes. There is definitely a strong support for Scotland becoming independent, but I don't take that for granted. People who want that, like me, have got to make the case, and we've got to make the case uh, that is relevant in the world uh, people live in. But that's an argument and a debate that I absolutely relish. You say um, can I just... After you. Sorry, yeah, and, and we've had a lot of comments this morning because I know you want to get on to local issues and, and, and national issues, in a way, uh, cost of living crisis. We've had a lot of comments this morning and been running a poll as well here on, on GMB. And it does say that most Scots think that you, Nicola Sturgeon, haven't done enough on the cost of living crisis. I'm sure that's very frustrating to you to hear that that's what they think. What more do you need to do and what have you not done? Well, firstly, I think it's understandable. People are really hurting and struggling right now. And I don't think when asked the question in a poll, they will be particularly minded to say that any politician has done enough because not enough generally is being done. My government has taken a lot of action, both in the immediate terms and uh, the, the sense and the shape of, of help with energy bills right now. But in a longer term sense, we've created a number of new uh, social security benefits to try to help lift people out of poverty. The, the key one is what we call the Scottish Child Payment, which is giving £20 a week to uh, families uh, with children on the lowest income. So we're doing a considerable amount. We will continue to seek to do more. But the fact of the matter is, and it is a fact, that most of the resources and, and most of the levers here around energy prices, around social security and welfare support still lie with Westminster okay. governments. And therefore, we do need to see... I, I need to take my responsibility, right. but we need to see Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak right. step up and do much more than they have done to date as the, well. The, the clock has counted us out, but I do want to slip in one last quick question and ask you for a quick answer. You've always said that uh, under independence, Scotland would get rid of the nuclear deterrent. You'd close the Fazlane base. Given what's happened in Ukraine and, and what Putin is up to and, and the barely veiled threats of using nuclear weapons, do you still feel that way, briefly? Yeah, I think nuclear weapons are, are dangerous and I think we should all be working towards a world without nuclear weapons. My party is very strongly anti-nuclear and I d wouldn't want to see an independent Scotland have nuclear weapons. I would want to see, and I should say that would put an independent Scotland into the same category as the vast majority of countries across the world. I would want to see an independent Scotland uh, be a fully participating, very constructive member of the NATO alliance because I think events of the past few weeks have underlined just how important that is. Nicholas Surgeon, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Good to talk to you, Thank Nicola. You. And uh, that's First Minister of Scotland. We've got uh, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, uh, on the show tomorrow for the first time in nearly five years. He's going to be chatting to Susanna Reid at Downing Street on Good Morning Britain.